Hey, everybody, it's the Drive School Podcast. I am Pastor Goodman. Uh, my, my friend, Pastor Merritt Dembski, is here with us today. Uh, Pastor Dembski will be one of the plenary speakers for this summer's Who Am I conference. He's going to be speaking out in Portland, Oregon at Lewis and Clark University, July 23rd to 26th. I got those dates out before I've forgotten them, and now I get to talk to you. How's it going, man? Doing well. And you? Doing really, really well. We, we, we made it to this side of Easter. We're gearing up for conference season. It's, it's a fun time of year. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, um, we get to we get to talk a little bit uh, this summer about who am I, and it's it's one of those questions that that gets asked a lot, but it has a lot of different answers, and it's almost the answers are going to be more and more different based on where you're starting from, even more so than where you're aiming at, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, so kind of well, expound upon why where a Christian might sort of take a different starting point because everybody gets upset about the ending, but if you're not starting in the same point, like how can you end there? Yeah. So ultimately, as Christians, we do have a different start point because our who am I answer is going to be something that's given to us rather than something that we've acquired. You know, it's not something that we go out and we we earn. It's not that we are the the sum of all of our uh, actions and, and habits and all that kind of stuff, but we are who Christ has called us. And so even though most people would just land at, I'm an athlete, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, you know, whatever. It's, I'm a baptized child of God who also cares for God's flock, who also plays sports, who also this or that. You know, so like we're always starting with Christ at the center and what he has given to us rather than just saying, here's all the stuff I do and therefore this is who I am. Yeah. I, I've kind of seen that taken a, a lot of ways. Does that mean like wear a Christian t-shirt with like a slogan on it everywhere you go? Like what is what is, what does it mean to be a, a baptized child of God who is also an athlete? Well, confessing that Christ is Lord first and foremost, but like Jesus says in the book of John, if you love me, keep my commandments. Like if you love me, then do what I say. Uh, sometimes we think about the the hearing side and we just say, okay, I heard what Jesus said. See ya. <laughs> you know, but yeah. when, when we talk about hearing and when the scriptures talk about hearing, hearing leads to action. You know, there's a lot of things that we just kind of stop, like remembering. Okay, I remembered. Well, if I say you need to remember your groceries, what that usually mean? Oh, man, I got to go to the grocery store and get the groceries, sure. you know, or um, in the Old Testament, God will say, did you not hear what I said? And almost any parent or any kid has heard before. Didn't you hear what I said? Which means not did you comprehend the words that came out of my mouth and did they enter into your ears, into your brain? But did you not do what I just said to do? You know, go shut the door and then the door doesn't get shut. Did you not hear what I said? Meaning, why didn't you do it? You know, so it's not just saying, well, I I wore a t-shirt that said Jesus loves you or Walmart. I don't know if Walmart still had them said y'all need Jesus, you know, which is a very true thing, even though the shirt's made to kind of be a chuckly thing. Um, sure. It's true. We all do need Jesus. Um, but when we hear, we do. And so this act of loving, this act of caring, um, actually putting Christ first in our lives, that sometimes that means that we stick out like a sore thumb in our culture, which wasn't always the case, but is increasingly the case when we're not going to the same events that other people are who aren't Christian, or when we're not condoning and supporting the things that other people who are not Christian are condoning and supporting when Christ is saying, here's how you live. Here, here is my will. Here is what I want you to do. Uh, love God and love others. And here are these commandments that say, here's how you do that. You know, um, so we we live out that Christian faith rather than just acknowledging that, oh, we know Jesus, but our knowing Jesus means our lives are shaped by him. Hmm. So I, I can see where the world is immediately going to start to draw lines with this, because I, I, I mean, first and foremost, well, if you, you don't know Jesus and you don't know the word, you're not going to be about doing the things that, that he says. Uh, where, where do we sort of start to to bump into the world then when we take this worldview out amongst everyone else? Well, definitely the definition of love, you know, the, the world is going to say love is um, supporting or holding on to whatever um, makes you feel happy and good. And as Christians, we say, yes, Christ desires what is best for us. And that doesn't always mean the happy joy, joy thing right now. Like sometimes 
we're, we're going to be sad. Sometimes it's going to be tough because there's going to be conflict. Jesus says that mothers and daughters and fathers and sons are going to be against one another because they're going to disagree on what Jesus says. And there's going to be those who reject what Christ says and going to be those who hold on to it. So um, our uh, definitely in our, our world that very much focuses around our own personal feelings and put the, puts those over everything else. That might be true, but I feel like this is true over here. And we, we run into conflict with that. Um, and it makes us sound terrible at times when we say, I know that that's how you feel about this, but this over here is what is true. You know, so um, we can think about this in very practical, obvious ways. You know, the child that goes up to an electrical outlet with a with a knife, we're not going to say, well, I know you feel like that's going to be a really good choice, <laughs> but I don't think that's going to be a good choice for you because there's this thing called electricity and metal conduction and you just, it's not going to go well for you. But I really want it because it feels so nice. Like, I don't think it's going to feel the way you think it's going to feel, you know, but it has a happy tingle for a moment. And then until it doesn't, right? Like it's it's not going to be good. So, um, but that's going to put us in conflict when we're prioritizing God's word over just our human logic or over our sentimentality, how we feel about things, and um, that's going to make us look different in a whole a whole variety of ways. It's not just going to be one thing. Um, this is going to affect every area of life um, if we talk about the athlete side and we say, I'm an athlete first and foremost, then that's going to take priority in our lives. No matter when the coach says you need to be there, no matter what tournament is coming on, um, it's going to be the thing that you have to be at. But if Christ is first and we say, here is when the body of Christ gathers, then all of a sudden we're not going to look like the best teammate when the team says, but you made a promise to this team. It's like, yeah, but Christ made a promise to me in my baptism first. And that happened a long time before I ever joined the team. You know, that this, this, this is going to take the priority over everything else. And, um, and that, that affects things that aren't even evil. I mean, I just mentioned athletics and stuff. Like, do we have a problem with athletics? No, not inherently. But when those things try to take over, but otherwise, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, why? I'm I'm really bad at sports, but otherwise, yeah, I, we we don't know sports either. So I mean, um, I know that I know that there are different ones, and I know that there are a variety of shapes of balls. But that's that's like that's, that's I know some it. pass kick. You know, um, the first day I just took a new call here in Iowa, and the first day we were here before I was um, installed here, the pastor who was the vacancy pastor was doing a children's message. And he held up a picture. He was talking about Christ being veiled at first, that you wouldn't recognize him after his resurrection. And the, he held up a picture of two people in suits and ties. And all the kids immediately recognized, which he didn't expect. And they were, they were, they were athletes, but he was figuring the kids would recognize them in their jerseys, but not but in normal there. people clothes, you know. But all the kids <laughs> recognized. And my wife's like, who are they? And I was like... I'm guessing athletics. I'm not sure, you know, and then it was football and we're like, what team is it? I don't know. Just wait for it to all play out. <laughs> you know, like, so like, yeah, but, um, we, we don't have a problem with, with, with many things that can be good and wonderful, but when they, they lose their proper placement and become our identity, that's when we start to see problems. Yeah. Well, and, and you also said there, there's a problem that sort of pops up even in, in um, did you hear what I said, which wasn't spoken to the unbelievers, but but God actually spoke that to the people who who believed. I know what I'm supposed to be doing as a Christian. I, I, there, there's 10 rules that there's not a lot. You, you memorize right. them. I know exactly who I'm supposed to be based on what I'm doing, but more often than not, I'm not. So <clears throat> what do I do when I, it comes to who am I in, in light of not being? The person who has done all the things that I was supposed to be doing. Well, then that's the the glorious thing about our identity in Christ is because who we are is now under Christ. It's no longer me standing in front of God saying, I didn't do good enough this week, or I should have done better. Hopefully I do better this upcoming week. Now, as Christians who are being sanctified, or like I say, set apartified, like, then yes, we are constantly being set apart from the world and our life will be looking different, but not to this point that like, we never sin anymore. But our identity is no longer found in 
the sum of keeping the commandments well enough or loving Jesus well enough. The sum of who we are is who Christ has called us. So when we look at all this and we say, what does it mean to be a Christian? It's clinging to Christ. And that is the work of the Spirit. So all of who we are is founded in who God has called us and who God makes us. Not in what we try to do or how we try to live well enough, but finding that peace and that contentment and that um, that unburdened conscience, knowing that Christ covers us in our baptism, knowing that his body and blood feeds us and strengthens us, knowing that he is the one who stands before our heavenly father and goes to God on our behalf so we don't have to picture ourselves standing there completely dirty and filthy, covered in rags before the perfect and beautiful throne of God saying, did I do okay? Did I do well enough this week? You know, but instead we get to gather together in the church and say, I confess I'm a poor, miserable sinner. I don't even have to try to justify it. I don't have to try to explain it away. I don't have to try to make sure that I look good enough to everyone, but I can acknowledge I've sinned. I've thought things I shouldn't have thought. I've said things I shouldn't have said. I haven't done things I should have done. And yet Christ has covered all of it. And all we can do is be those beggars, like Luther says, you know, and, mm-hmm. and to know that this is where we get the forgiveness and mercy. And that doesn't mean that we don't strive to live and to walk as Christ calls us to, but our peace and comfort is found in who Christ has made us rather than in our failures and in our greatest attempts. So we're not trying to justify ourselves in the law. And especially today, all this stuff about identity in a variety of ways, you know, we don't gather together together as Christians, just to say, um, let's make you a better man or a better woman or a better father or a better mother. But we say, here's what Christ has done for you. Cling to him and love as he's called you to love. And now here's what that looks like as a mother, as a father, as a son, as a daughter. But ultimately, it's finding our peace and our comfort in Christ. I love that. When we started talking, you, you said, I don't hop between two identities where like I go to church on Sunday for an hour, but then really I'm, I'm an athlete the rest of the week or, or mm-hmm. not me, but uh, you know, other people. Yeah. Are good at that. Um, <laughs> yeah. or, or, but in the same way, I, I love sort of the picture that you painted that I don't sort of hop between two identities of, I am a sinner who has rejected uh, all of God's stuff or who has not lived up. And then I'm going to try better. And then I'm going to be a Christian this week. We, we have one identity. Um, mm-hmm. And and you're right. It, it has multiple parts in the same way that I am a baptized Christian who is a husband and a father and a pastor. I, I am a, a baptized Christian who also mm-hmm. daily struggles with sin. So how do we have only one identity despite the fact that everything seems to be pulling at the seams? Well, and that's the tension we live in. And it's a beautiful tension that many Christians have lost sight of that they're just not aware of. And I did not grow up Lutheran, but one of the things that, two of the things that brought me to becoming Lutheran was learning about baptism and grace and knowing that it wasn't God's blessing to me after I've done all I could do, which is what Mormons would say. I wasn't Mormon, but you know, like that's functionally what we say. God gives you grace after you've done all you can do, <laughs> you know, but it's, you don't need no. it anymore. Yeah, exactly. Like he gives you grace in that he pulls you from death without any work on your part. He pulls you into life. And yet the second part that was so influential to me was hearing about that sinner saint paradox, finding out that, yeah, I still struggle with sin. And yet in Christ, I am a redeemed, uh, I'm a saint. I am set apart in Christ because of what he has done. And that this is something that we will struggle with. And so we need to hear God's word calling us to repentance and faith. We need to hear God's forgiveness shown to us. And we say, but that's such a weird paradox. Well, we live in this in different ways. Christ is totally God and totally man. Scripture is written by man and yet breathed out by God. The the Lord's Supper, you know, is, is bread and wine, but it is the body and blood of Christ there with us and for us. And so it's not a surprise that as we walk through our lives, we say, I'm a Christian, but I realized I did this thing and I'm really frustrated. Well, God be praised, the Holy Spirit's working in you that you're frustrated about that. The fact that the Holy Spirit is is calling you to repent and say, I'm sorry, Lord, I should not have done that. And knowing that Christ has already bled and died, that it's not even a matter of, um, I am I am emotional enough when I say it, and that's how I'm saved or something like that. But that sure. Christ, through his death and resurrection, has made you perfect. So when you acknowledge it, you say, Lord, I, I have sinned and thought, word, and deed, not just saying this like a robot, but believing it 
And you get to hear, you are forgiven in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one you were baptized into. That is your identity that Christ has given to you. You, you talked about frustration, and, and, and so now everybody's frustrated because there's Christians, and, and that's how you know you're doing it, right? Which is a weird <laughs> thing to say, but like, right. I'm frustrated with myself, and, and that's actually a sign that it's working, that I have these two wills, that old Adam is struggling but drowning, and new right. man is actually emerging and arising, but also the world is frustrated with me because now I have different different wants and different goals than than anybody who, who would not necessarily have, well, Christ a, a, at his center. So why, if you don't have a hope and a risen Lord, why would you care too much about his, his rules if they make you feel frustrated. So if, if we're going to sort of mark, who am I? Um, is there, is there just sort of constant frustration and, 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 you know, you just sort of bear it until you die or, or is there some, uh, some other sort of mark that, that I'm in the right place other than I'm really frustrated right now? No, it's just pretty terrible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, we, 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 we do suffer. We do face temptation. Yeah. We do face trial and all these things. I've been reading through Pilgrim's Progress again. And, um, and there's some interesting points that are brought up in Pilgrim's Progress. I mean, there's theological things that we disagree with, with um, Bunyan and the way he presents things in various ways. But there are also things about the life of the pilgrim, the life of the Christian, the difficulty and the suffering that comes along with that. But what do we have? We have joy and peace. I mean, the God who made us, the God who, who created everything, actually hears you when you pray. The God who is in control of all things continues to be in control even in your life. So that, that when we go through our days, we might face suffering, but then we remember what Paul says. None of this suffering compares to the, the glory that will be when Christ returns, right? That there is, there's nothing that compares to what it's going to be like when we, when we are with Christ. And so when we get that bigger picture, yes, we suffer right now. But our goal isn't just, well, I got to get the suffering stuff out of the way and then I can have a happy life. Like there's going to be happy times. There's going to be sad times. But in the midst of all of it, our identity founded in Christ says there's a gigantic picture here. Like it is a far bigger picture than just what's happening right at this moment and what will happen tomorrow or the day after that. Ultimately, every day we are living with peace because like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, don't be anxious. Look at the birds I provide for them. Look at the, um, the flowers I clothe them. So don't be anxious about food and clothes. We hear other places, don't be worried about tomorrow. There's enough to worry about today. I know that's surprising because we live in a very peaceful and not crazy world, but <laughs> like we, we do live in a, in a chaotic world. And so it is a, a good reminder from Jesus that yeah, there are a lot of crazy things that are going to happen and there's enough happening today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Like, don't be, don't be afraid of all those other things. Just know that you are in Christ. And I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I mean, the life of a Christian is one that is ready at any moment to be with Christ. Like, that's what we do. I, that's what we're called to do. We're not called to be ready to be 105. We're not called to be ready to retire. We're not called to be ready for all these things. We're not ready to be, we're not called to be ready for the worst case scenario that could happen in our culture or around the world. We're called to be ready to be in Christ. We're called to be ready to suffer as Christ has suffered. And with that comes great joy because what is there to worry about? There's nothing to be scared of. I mean, God constantly told his people, don't fear. Yeah, but there's that thing. Yeah, don't fear. But what about those tall people? Don't fear, right? And yet that's what we constantly do. We want to fear. We get sucked into every headline. We get sucked into everything. And then we don't know what ends up. But then we gather together in Christ and we hear, oh yeah, he's your king and he's in charge. And there's evil in the world, but he's coming back. And all this evil will be nothing compared to how wonderful it is when we are in Christ. And so we hold on to that hope and that peace in the midst of suffering and know that he is returning in glory and we look forward to the resurrection. So the resurrection and, and being in Christ is where we find the peace and comfort in the midst of the trial and the difficulties. We read scripture and we pray and we're tempted and all those kind of things. So if we're going to answer the question, then what, when, when you get to, to grab the plenary stage, um, what, what one thing do you want the kids to take home when they ask the question, who am I? You are a baptized child of God who receives eternal life. Like that is, that is the one thing that you are in Christ and therefore you have life forever. That being in Christ means you're actually alive now. 
you were born dead, but you're going to die alive and you're going to live forever after that. <laughs> like you're, you're born dead in your trespasses and sins. And yeah. unless Christ returns first, you're going to die living. But that's only going to be for like a little bit. <laughs> and then you're going to be alive for eternity with Christ. So there's a grander picture than all the things we could get sucked into in this world. I love that. Pastor, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to see you in Portland, Oregon, July 23rd to 26th. Pastor Dembski, thanks so much. Oh, wonderful. It's glad to be here. God's peace be with you.